priests. The priests formed a distinct, a distinct brotherhood among themselves, and they kept the knowledge and the powers, the knowledge of of the word and how to execute the deeds. They kept this as close as a close secret, and only taught the common people as much or as little as they thought fit. But although we date our ceremonies only as far back as this, we must go back thousands of years before to find the origin of the most of most of the signs and symbols. So even here, Dr. Ben is saying that we even have to go thousands of years before that. So when are we going to get to the root in the Tobia and get to the Gutas and the Ethiopic root? Well, here we begin, and here we are starting to get to the, 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 the origins. Some of these date from the earliest mythos, or the earliest of the mishtir. Mishtir means mystery. If you look up the word myth, even in, especially in the Schofield or the, or the Strong's Concordance, go to the Strong's Concordance and find in the English where myth is, and then do the, the, the Greek um, study, the back work on that and then get to the very root of the word mutos, mythos, and you'll find the mishtir, or mystery, the mystery. And we're taught that there's a mystery of God in Christ, and in order to comprehend this mystery of the Moshiach, you understand, or, or the, 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 the God in Christ, or, or God, the Almighty, in and through the Moshiach, who we know as our Black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christos, one must deal with the earliest of the myths and the types because they contain the keys. And this is why these areas of Scripture have not been fully disclosed or revealed and why the world continues to stumble on in such a time of a new beginning. In other words, we're in a new age time right now. We're at the cusp of the 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 millennium, the, the 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 eighth millennium we call it Ethiopically, or the messianic age. But because many of the the beings are out of alignment and because of all the tensions and the negativity, these things are what are causing the tribulations in this present time because of that lack of knowledge, that lack of preparation, that lack of alignment. We're moving into a time where heaven and earth is coming into alignment, but men and people are still out of alignment. They're out of alignment with God, with, the Almighty, with themselves, but with themselves in God and in the creation of things. And this is why studying with the Torah teachings and, and really beginning to comprehend and see how it all comes together begins to make so much sense and spiritually it, it creates in us that innocence that innocence so we become again as those children of God because of that knowledge of the Son of God the Bain Ha Elohim or Yeshua Ha Moshiach so here we can recognize the earliest of the mythos actually go back to the so-called stellar mythology. Not not to go into that level of study right now, but the stellar mythology, so-called, is, is strictly Sabian. And as we mentioned before, the Sabians were Afro-Shemites, Ethiopian Hebrews, because of that link with Abraham. And you can refer to... Uh, document that in Genesis chapter 25, the first four or five verses will make that very clear, that the Medeanites are related and descendants of Abraham, and so are the Shebians or the Shabians or the Sabians or the Sabians. Now, furthermore, um, Dr. Ben says here on pages 290 and 292, Church would also state the following about the craft. Often it's called the craft. In the Bible it says it uses the word wisdom. Today we would call it technology. 
the word technology today in ancient times was called the wisdom or the mystery school. Some would some refer to these as mystery schools, but really they were wisdom schools. Today we call the colleges and universities wisdom schools. But with the Europeans and their system, they call this the craft. You understand the craft. It's known as the craft. Long before the, the so-called seat, what's known as the seat of Jehovah, the throne of King David, which is the throne of Yahweh God, is linked with the seat of Osar. And that seat, let's just demonstrate right here. This is what we're talking about when we talk about this seat. This is what we're talking about, the ma'at. This is what we mean. So when Moses sat to judge, to perform the pitta or the fitta, the fetha, the fitta, the justice, he sat upon this seat right here. So this seat is also known as the seat of Osar or Jeshurun. We know it as the, 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 the seat of David or the throne, that right angle, righteousness, justice, truth, ma'at. Now, in Judaism, there's no seat in that sense. It doesn't come out of Judaism. Before it was Judaic, it was Ethiopic. Before it was Judaic, it was Egyptian. You understand? Before it was Judaic, so to speak. But even we'll find out that Judaism, true Judaism, also comes out of Tobia, Ethiopia. Now, Judeo Christianity, Islam, the Africans, the Afro Shemites, you understand? They are those who created this seat of worship, but the seat of worship was for. The Egyptians called this god Ptah, or this ancestor, the Fitta, the Fitta, or justice, Pita, Fitta, as in the Fitta Negesht, or the law, the justice of kings. But originally, it was also known as the seat of Amen, Amen Re, Amen. Now, note that Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, Christ speaks and says that. He is the Amen. You understand? He is the Amen, the, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. So, Churchward, he, he says a couple words here that we want, want to um, add and link with this. And let me show you this right here. So you can see this, this, this image right here. You see them on, the, you see the seat. You see that seat? You see that square? You see the square? You see the square? That, that is the seat. And Moses sat. Right? Moses sat. And he rendered judgment from morning to evening. Moses sat. And he rendered judgment. Now what does Church Ward say right here? Church Ward says, Much is made in masonry of acting on the square acting on the square. So we can interpret this and read this from the the plain text, Moses sat to judge, or Moses acted on the square. Moses acted on the square. And this is the foundation now of this whole matter. Moses acted on the square. How did he know how to act that way? Because he was learned in all the wisdom of the Egypts and he was mighty in the word. And D. So in the Egyptian Ma'at, and what was known as the Egyptian Ma'at, the Egyptian Ma'at was the hall. It was the hall of judgment. And who sat in that particular hall of judgment? It was the Osar, the Osar, or Greek eyes, Osiris. But Hebraized, it is the Jeshurun, the Yishrun. Judging the who? Judging the dead. Upon the square, he sat to judge. That is imaged by what we call today the so-called Masonic Square, which was first employed. 
Now we have to understand this was first employed in squaring the stones of the builders and next in squaring the conduct, in squaring the conduct in the sphere of morals of the so-called Masonic or the Brotherhood or the Masonic Brotherhood, which in Egypt was as old as the Brotherhood of the Seven, the Seven Kemu, or the Seven Masons, the Seven Builders. You know, in the Bible it says that the stone which the builders refuse has become the head of the corner. I mean, how significant is this? Who are these builders? Ask any so-called Christian or even the Jews, who were these builders? Where it says that the stone which the builders refuse, who are these builders? Because these Psalms are very ancient. So who are these builders? They will tell you that the, the Jews will say the stone is Christ or the Moshiach. We say it's our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua. They will say it's the Moshiach who they expect to come. The Christian will say that is Jesus Christ. You understand? But who are the builders? And how many builders are there? Egypt and Tobia and ancient Ethiopia will explain it. Explain that these seven are the seven Kremu, the seven masons who assisted Ptah, Sitte, you understand? Sitte, the Sitha, the Sitha Negesht, the law of the kings in building the heavens on the square. In building, you see this square right here? This is that square. In building the heavens on the square of which the ideograph and the hieroglyphic language is the Masons and the Masonic square. Now, Pata, Fitte, Fitte, which is Ethiopic. Fitte. See, Fitte is the, is, is, is the clearest evidence that the whole matter basically is Ethiopic or, linguistically speaking, Afro-Shemitic. Pata, in the Egyptian mythology, was the first great architect of the universe, because law, the Sitha Negesht, is that document of that first great architect of the universe, which he built the seven assistants, the heavens, on the square. Previously, it was in the form of a triangle. Isn't this interesting? Previously, it was in the form of a triangle. And the stone squares, they date from that time. Now, Sitte, or Pata, was the very great God, or an Elohim. Now, even when we say Elohim in the Hebraic, we know that Elohim also refers to what? To who? The judges. The judges are called, scripturally, the Elohim. And let's document it. Let's go and document it. Come on, let's document it. How do we know that the judges or the Elohim, the gods, are actually, how do we know that the gods are actually judges? That one of the, the references of the gods among Israel, among us, are judges. So this also helps us to understand some so-called deep or hidden esoterical matters. You understand? And here we go right here. It should be right here. It is uh, 22 and 28. In 22 and 28 it says, Thou shalt not revile the gods. Now if you study this area of scripture and, and some of the Jewish documentation and, and others that go into some of the deeper aspects, they will explain that the gods are Elohim. It says Elohim. In the land, but these Elohim are to refer to the judges. The judges were considered to be like the gods. They represented the Elohim, the divine will, like with the psalm that says, El stands in the congregation, you understand, of Elohim and judges, you understand, or stands in the congregation of El and judges among the Elohim. 
and it says, nor curse the ruler of thy people. So the ruler, the one who is the ruler is like the king. And then the judges, now you see the link with Moses. Moses is said to be a god to Pharaoh. He's a Elohim to Pharaoh. Now here he is the judge. In Deuteronomy 33 and 5, we learn, or 4, we learn that he is a king. So all of this fits within the matrix. You understand? Within that Ethiopic matrix right there. So in continuing this, so we can move forward to the other matter that is at hand. So Pata came into being from the earliest of time. He is called a father of fathers, power of powers, father of beginnings, and creator of the eggs of the sun and the moon, lord of Ma'at, or justice, king of the two lands, who created his own image, who fashioned his own body, who established Ma'at, Throughout the two lands, but Ta it was who fashioned the new bodies in which the souls of the dead were to live in the underworld. He was the great artificer in metals, and he was at once smelter and caster and sculptor, as well as the master architect and designer of everything which exists in the world and the universe. I am Hatep or Ayimhotep was Horus or Kheru. Once again, we come across another ancient Egyptian word that we can get the proper etymology and the right meaning when we go to the Ethiopic. Kheru. Kheru. Kherui means elect. In the Ethiopic, Horus or Kherui, it means the elect or the chosen one. So this, is, this makes the matter very clear. It is he who brought on as the son of Ptah, Ayimhotep, Kherui, the chosen, brought on as the son of Ptah or Fitit, the divine healer, the good physician, the healer of the bodies of mortals during this life. And through him, the good spirits were brought and presented to his father. Now, it's interesting that Christ would say that those who are whole, holistic, in other words, don't need a physician. Only the sick do. And he said that Joe will say to me the old adage, like the old proverb, physician, heal thyself. Now, it's interesting because if you look throughout um, the Torah and the scriptures and the Tanakh, you don't find that particular quotation. You understand? Most likely it's a very earlier and older quotation coming out of Egypt because Yahweh called his son out of Egypt. So, Ayu is the same, but another name for him. The Inpata is the commencement of the fatherhood. In Pata, we have the beginning of of fatherhood and this is what makes it so significant and it connects directly with the matter before us with pata with justice with fit is the beginning of fatherhood all was motherhood before all was the motherhood before now we have the fatherhood you understand the establishment of fatherhood what we really have now is family and what we really have now is order. And this now goes into the primitive sociology of ancient cultures, of how ancient cultures, especially after what is often called the fall, you understand, ancient societies, it took them a, a stages to return to stability and stasis. You see, after the, the spiritual, the psychic fall is similar to how we are living today in post uh, slick woolly lynchism. You see, we're living in the stage of where all is motherhood now, and the fatherhood needs to be established. So, this is an interesting matter. You know, when we look at where society is currently today. And we look at the social issues, 
and we think the social issues we face today are unique and without any precedent. But alas, there is ancient precedent in principle for where we are today. And the same principal keys and solution from yesterday are still scientifically applicable for us today, especially in the science of the true faith. So there's much more we can go into on this, but we're going to pause it. We're going to pause it. This is just a couple of quotes from Black Man of the Now and his family. Uh, interesting, we call these sort of books like they're, they're resource and reference books. There's a lot of reference material and matter that we can find in here and then compare it with our own Ethiopic studies and perhaps uh, highlight or build up on certain areas which some of the former writers were not able or did not get to, but they provided us with a good a good reference point in such a work as this. So we point this out to you all. But now let us continue. Let us let us return to eighteen um eighteen Exodus eighteen and three. Thirteen, eighteen and thirteen. So at 18 and 13, going over this again, so we're going to move forward from this verse. Now, take this down. We're going to um, clear this in a moment, but take this down. Um, and this verse again is, And it came to pass on the morrow, this is after Jethro and Aaron and the elders of Israel, they sat, they ate bread with Moses' his father-in-law before God. Notice what it says. They ate bread with Moses' father-in-law, it says before God. This is this is interesting. The contextuality of this. It didn't say before Yahweh, and it say before Jehovah, but it says before Elohim. Then in verse thirteen, and it came to pass on the morrow at that Moses sat to judge the people, that Moses sat to judge the people, the people stood by Moses from morning to the evening. Verse fourteen. And when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did to the people, he said, what is this thing that thou doest to the people? Why sittest thou thyself alone, and all the people stand by thee from morning to evening? Now, here's what's interesting, that Moses' um, Ethiopian Hebrew, Afro-Shemitic father-in-law, Jethro, sees Moses sitting in, in the judgment seat. You know, we're sitting in, in judgment seat, ma'at, seeking to perform law and order and proper governance among the people from early in the morning until, until the sun was going down. And Moses' father-in-law, Yotor, Jethro, he asks, when he saw all of this, he says, what is this thing that thou doest to the people? Question. First of all, what are you doing with the people? They all have to, because everyone has to come and plead their case one by one by one. You understand? And that's why it took him like all day to do this. And here's the key. The next question. Why sittest thou thyself alone? Why are you doing this work alone? This is a, this is a, well, let us not put any words in Jethro's mouth. Let's just go on. And Moses said to his father-in-law, verse 15, because the people come to me to inquire of God. They are coming to me to inquire of Elohim. So Moses rightly viewed this as his, his duty, his service to answer them when they came to inquire of Elohim. But Moses was doing this task all by himself. I almost could say, and, uh, you know, this is why I find this so important because ones, ones have reached out and said, well, we want to get involved in this ministry and this work in, in line of Judah and society and, and the propagation of the good news and the preparation for the millennial kingdom of the King of Kings and Jesus Christ. What do we, you know, what do we do? Where do we start? 
here. This is where we start. We start right here. You understand? Because when Moses went on to say, when they have a matter, they come to me, and I judge between one and another. Now, just recall a little bit earlier, well, not a little bit, about 40 years ago. You remember a little more than 40 years ago when um, after Moses had, had killed the Egyptian and buried him in the sand, and then he came by another day, and his own so-called Hebrew brethren and others were saying, um, um, who has made you a judge over us, you know, so forth and so on. They got a little attitude, and that's when Moses, he, he, he hightailed it out of that town. But Moses now is accepting this, 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 judge, this judgeship, you understand? Because remember, Judah, Judger, you know, there's a there's a there's a very crucial link between Judah and Judge Judicial, you understand? And so this is about the reforming the 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 way they adjudicated a matter, how they got justice for themselves. And Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to inquire, uh, to me to inquire of Elohim when they have a matter, they come to me and I judge between one and another. And I do make them know the statutes of God, of Elohim, and his laws. This is interesting. Because at this time, the Ten Commandments has not yet been revealed. So that means there were already laws. There were already statutes. There was already uh, a way of doing things, a right way, you understand, of doing things. So Moses... When people came to him, usually with the wrong way, Moses would let them know well what the right way is. But the key thing is there were already there were already statutes so far, and there were already laws. See, some would even say that Abraham with Abraham there was no commandments, and we can find in the scripture where it says that Abraham kept my charge, he kept my statute, he kept my my laws and. You know, my command. It says that there were commands even in Abraham's time. You see, some believe that when Moses did what he did, or when the Ten Commandments was promulgated, that's the first time there were laws. So even here in the Scripture, this disputes it. See, there's a, there's a particular peculiar reason for those additional laws that came down after the Ten Commandments, for the same reason why the priesthood of the Levites was initiated because the people were unwilling to be a nation, a holy nation, a priestly nation. So therefore, one tribe was set aside to fulfill that. And because they were not able to keep the pure law of Yahweh, which the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words, rather. It's one command, actually. But the Ten Words, the Decalogue, they were not able to keep that. They had fallen. They had already fallen short of the glory, even though they admitted at first, we will do. So their, their mouth spoke before their heart and their head assented. That's what happened. So that also teaches us something, that we have to learn from that and also learn what was the course because of that. You understand? What did that cause because they did that? That's the lesson. And then we look in our own lives, you understand, and we see how that reflects on us. What do we learn by that? And then how can that reflect light or illumination to us in our personal walk and our collective walk as well, individually, as an I, and I and I and I together. So Moses' father-in-law in verse 17, he said to him, the thing that thou doest is not good. He said, this is not Tob. This is not Tov. This is not Tov, my old. This is not Tov. This is not, this is not good. He said, it's not good. He said, it's not Tob, it's not good. Verse 18 says, Thou will surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee. You will wear yourself out, Moses. Both, you're going to wear yourself and the people 
out in this way. For this thing is too heavy. You know what I'm saying? It's too heavy for thee. Not that Moses could not, but this this is about nation building. This is where we are in the society of His Majesty right now. This is why I, I, I know these, this teaching here is very important, and I hope and pray that as many of the brothers and sisters, you understand, pay attention to this right here. This is how we can begin to get our Father's house, the King of Kings' house, in proper and good governmental theocratic order. You see, this, this is the establishment of a theocratic order. You understand, an ordinance here. And this is why this section known as um, Jethro or Yotor or Yitro is so very important because it's Moses, Ethiopian, Hebrew, father-in-law that's giving him some very, very important advice here. So he says, thou will surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee, for this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone, that you're not able to do this, this work by yourself. And brothers and sisters, I and I is not able to do this work by I and I ourselves either. You know, and this is one of the reasons why we, we spend this time in, in teaching and trying to be as diligent as possible, you understand, and really sincerely seeking to present this word, you understand, so that as many who are willing will be able to receive and hopefully be responsible, you understand, Resp able to respond and respond accordingly. But those who have responded and those who are responding, I want you to pay attention because we're going to get qualifications here. There are some important qualifications here that that what Moses Ethiopian father in law is, is, is gonna is, is gonna teach him here. He says in verse nineteen, he says, Hearken now to my voice. So twice he said he spoke to Moses doing this by himself alone. That yes, Moses sat on the square, but he sat on the square by himself. All the people gathered around him from morning to evening. You know, what I'm and surely he must have been doing this even day by day. And Jethro, being his father-in-law, and also overstanding govern governance, being a high priest of the Medeanites and a member of the Ethiopian, the greater Ethiopian nation and the race of the Ethiopians, the Tobians, he understood that there are better ways of, of governance. And notice how Jethro gives this advice. He says, hearken now to my voice. He says, I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to Godward. In other words, be you for the people pointing to God. And that thou mayest bring the causes to God. In other words, that in other words, stay stay with God in front of you. Keep Jah first is what he's saying. Keep Jah first so that you may be able to help them with jolly with wisdom. You understand? With the wisdom of Jah, with the word of Jah, with the encouragement and the good good law and order of Jah. Then he goes on to say in verse 20, And thou shalt teach them ordinances. What you shall teach them is ordinances and laws. And shall shew them the way wherein they must walk. Show them what is, what is the halakha. Show them what the akahed, akahed, Ethiopic or Amharic. Halakha is Hebrew, is the, the biblical translations is our conversation in, in the sense of New Testament, which is our behavior, how we conduct ourselves. Literally, our walk. Bamarinya in the Amharic, we say akahed. What your akahed? What one's walk? So you say one's, one's walk is funny. You understand? Their, their, their akahed, the way they go about, is not really in the proper order. It might be a little bit here, a little bit there. You understand? It's like one foot in, one foot out. They're going to get split on the fence. 
But when one's akaheda walk is proper, then Jah's light may fully illuminate and shine and guide one, and one can be a light and a guidance as well to others. So Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, Yotor, he's saying to teach them ordinances and laws, to teach them the right ordinances, you know, the right order of things. For example, the ordinances would be like um, keeping the Shabbat, for example, that's that's the test ordinance right there, keeping the Shabbat, yet the Kedasa, holy, set apart. Because one cannot keep so-called one day. How, what is one doing the other six days? It makes you quite, makes you wonder. And if they claim that they are and doesn't really matter, and Josh say it does matter, well, their, their walk is funny. You understand? Because by what authority do they declare such to be true? by their own man-made makeup, make-believe authority, but not by the clear revealed word of the King of Kings and his Christ in the B-I-B-L-E, because for I and I part, I and I glory in the Bible. But first, we must learn it. You understand? We must study it. We must get informed about it. And practice makes perfect, brothers and sisters. Verse 21 Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men. So he says, first of all, generally instruct the people. Give them the basics. You know, and basically give them the basics. Give them the overview. And then provide out of all the people. Now after you, like, instruct all the people, then provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, those who reverence Jah, who have a reverence, you understand, for the sustainer, men of truth, ones who are honest, you see, ones who are honest people, men of truth. I don't mean that they are perfect, flawless, whatever, but if they made a mistake, they admit a mistake, you know what I mean? It's not no little, no little um, deceptive, not deceptive, but men of truth, right? Hating covetousness, that means ones whose natures demonstrate that they don't take delight in having what belongs to another one. You know, like somebody might see, a, 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 like a brother may see a next brother and sister and, and think she's attractive and say, yeah, man, I like to, that's covetousness. Or you may see what next man have and say, yeah, man, I wish I had, that's covetousness. Yes, we've all, at some time or another, probably have been tempted to covet, but still, we must learn to hate covetousness, you understand, because that, that breeds a lot of psychic burdens at the same time, you see, but these are the, these are the standards, these standards here, first of all, they have to be able, they have to be able, you understand, to say willing, not unwilling, you understand? One possessing the, the skills and, and, and the teachable. If they already know it, they're willing to use their knowledge. If they don't know it, they're teachable. They're able to be taught. Such as reverence God, that have a, have a fear. And then say those who love God. Everybody says they love God, but no, respect Jah. You know what I'm saying? Respect Jah, respect. See, if you don't respect, people say they love God and they don't even read his word, don't care about his word. But if you reverence him, then you want to make sure you, you know what pleases him. You know what I'm saying? And he says reading his word, you know what I'm saying? Like in Revelation, he who reads it is blessed. He who reads it. So seeking it, you might not understand everything all at once, but because you seek it, you understand? The Almighty, he takes note of you. You understand? You can come to him, you know, because you are seeking. You understand? You are seeking him, in other words. Now, men of truth and hating covetousness. So these are four, they are fourfold. Remember what we were saying about the square? About squaring the heavens? Remember that? Squaring the heavens? So here, Jethro Yotor is teaching his Ethiop, his, his, his Hebrew son-in-law, saying, listen, you cannot be taking all that responsibility upon you like that with all the people. I mean, th 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 there were thousands of people. Some conservatively estimate 
there were less than a million, but somewhere around maybe 600,000. Imagine just 60,000. Imagine the 600 people you have to deal with their issues, one person, day in, day out. You, you know what I mean? They, they have valid issues. They have valid. Moses, he understood that it was difficult, but he recognized that he was the one, you understand, who was spiritually empowered and intellectually um, able and willing, and therefore he sat in such a responsibility. But now his father-in-law is telling him something very important. Now this right here would... This, what he tells him here, is, is, is the foundation of all military orders. All military orders derive their basic structure from right here, what we're about to read right now in verse 21 of Exodus chapter 18, where it says, And place, over, place such over them. Now, provide out of all the people able men, such as, reverence Jah, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such, and place these kind of people over them, over the multitude of the people, you understand, over the rest of the people, to be rulers of thousands, and rulers of hundreds, and rulers of fifties, and rulers of ten. Here's what we get in the basic church the the churchical what's it the the militant church the militant church or the church militant you know when we say we are soldiers of the lord but here's the beginning of this soldiery because here we have first of all we have um the major that that is ruler of thousands then we have ruler of hundreds if i'm correct that's lieutenant then we got rulers of 50 that's the sergeant, and then we have rulers of tens, and that is the corporal, or in the New Testament church, that is the diakon, the diakon. Diakon means of, of ten, one who is over ten, diakon, as we have decalogue, which means the ten word, diakon, ruler of, of, of tens. And it says, furthermore, verse 22, and let them judge the people. Now let them do what? Let them show fat. Let, let them judge. Let them sit on their squares. You see? So what it is, there is one who is prepared, Moses, our, our great lawgiver, Moses, who has learned in all the wisdoms of the Egypts and mighty in word and deed. He was judging all by his onesome, all by his alonesome. You understand? I mean, and, and this is, it's a heavy, even to minister brothers and sisters, though I love to reason with the brothers and sisters who, who, are, who are truly brothers and sisters who I and I have been reasoning and have reasoned with. Yet, to be able to deal with many of the issues, more of you, you all must be willing to come into the order that the Word is showing us. And this chapter, this section right here shows that. There are qualifications, you understand? And then there's a command. And it says, and let them judge the people at all seasons. And it shall be that every great matter they shall bring to thee. That every matter that is above their, you could say, acumen or what they are able to, you know, all really big matters. In other words, the, the, the daily issues and, and, and the more mundane or the petty issues, you know, even in that we need to have 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 a sense of law and order. What do you think the so-called policemen and, and the we say fire bun the police, fire bun Babylon? Well, for their wickedness, yes. But for law and order, John gives us our own structure of, of, of dealing with ourselves and with one another and with community and with a people 
even us right now in diaspora and scattered all over the place, is a big multitude, brothers and sisters. And one, even Moses, could not do it, in that sense, all by himself. But he had to hear and heed this word. And we see that he did. Now let's read on. It says, um, but every small matter they shall judge, so shall it be easier for thyself, and they shall bear with thee, or bear the burden with thee. If thou shalt do this thing, and Elohim command thee so, then thou shalt be able, then you will be able to endure. And all this people shall also go to their place, Beth Salaam, in peace. So Moses hearkened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said. And Musa, Moses, chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads, made them rases. This is where the title, we can even say, really, Aleka, or in another sense, Ras or Rosh, over the people, rulers of thousands the majors, rulers of hundreds, the lieutenants, rulers of fifties, the sergeants, and rulers of tens, the corporals. And they judged the people at all seasons. The hard causes they brought to Musa, but every small matter they judged themselves. And Moses let or allowed his father-in-law to depart, and he went his way into his own land. Notice something. It didn't say what land. We assume um, Medea, uh, Medina, you understand, or the Medean night land, you understand? But actually, we can say he went returned to Ethiopia, to Ethiopia. So, what is interesting, some say that this was a so-called, um, uh, we see a footnote here where some say that Jehovah in, in entirely ignored this worldly wise organization, substituting his own order in Numbers 11 and 14. So let's just go to 11 and 14 for a moment. And um, it say, he says, I'm not able to bear all this people alone because it's too heavy for me. And if thou deal thus with me, he says, kill me, I pray thee out of hand, if I have found favor in thy sight, and let me not see my wretchedness. And um, here we have the 70, here's what the elders are called, the 70 elders, and there's a reference to Exodus 18 and 19. And Yahweh said to Musa, Gather to me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them to the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may stand there with me. And I will come down and talk with thee there, and I will take of the spirit which is upon thee, and will put it upon them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bear it not alone thyself. And say, and say thou to the people, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow, and ye shall eat flesh, for ye have wept in the ears of Yahweh, saying, Who shall give us flesh to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you flesh, and ye shall eat. Ye shall not eat one day, so it's going to um, um, that uh, when the people um, when the people gorges themselves on on the debtors, it's going to speak about that part when the people gorges themselves on the debtors, because it says, then the Lord came down in the cloud and spake to him and took of the spirit that was upon him and gave it to the seventy elders and came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. Now, some say that Jehovah Yahweh ignored 
this worldly organization, but we see throughout that um, there was such such order among Israel from such a time. And actually here is speaking about another aspect, you understand, about the complaints that Moses, you understand, um, the complaints, um, the people... The people and their complaints concerning the flesh pots of Egypt. That was not a small matter. That was rightly a a, a great matter. And Moses brought that matter to to Jah to Yah, and he basically said that he would take of of that spirit, so that the 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 seventy elders also as it was more on the more prophetic level. What Moses was sitting in judgment of was the basic day-to-day stuff. You know, um, you know, almost like the court TV sort of stuff. You know, the family matters, the the business kind of contractual matters. You know, so this guy took my goat or sheep or something like that sort of matters. Um, what we have in Numbers chapter 11. Is 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 not a small matter, you understand? Not a small matter, but it's a great matter. So the footnote that we have in Schofield in the Schofield Study Bible is a footnote under chapter eighteen where it says that um, Jehovah entirely ignored this. Um, that's not really true. Nowhere. That's that's just the um, the 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 scribal. That's like a scribal a, 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 a scribal commentary given, and in one of the few places we have to disagree with um, the Schofield Study Bible on that particular area because we go to their reference and see that actually, as we explain, it's not a small matter. It's a great matter. And in the advice of Jethro, Moses' Ethiopian father-in-law, he did make provisions for that. And matters that are, are great, let them take it to you and you be to God word. You understand? So you, you be to God word that they may bring the causes to God. You understand? That you may bring their causes to God. And that's exactly what happened in the Kadesh. Barnea and the flesh pots and so forth and so on. The people were again complaining, you know, about um, just 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 whining, bitching and moaning out in the wilderness um, because though they were taken out of Egypt, um, Egypt wasn't taken out of them. This exodus, this coming out of the north country, shall be much different in that respect. Those who are spiritually Egyptians, in other words, have no desire to come out and basically can't come out because the word says Babylon is a cage of very foul and unclean spirits. So unless one is born again in spirit and in truth and really has a renewed heart and mind, they, this word is not for them. This teaching, this truth is not for them, and there's plenty of other distractions to keep them occupied. But you, my brothers and sisters, I and I love the eye because you love studying the word of our Father, Abba, and the teachings of his majesty in Yeshua HaMoshiach, Jesus Christos. So, brothers and sisters, um, we're going to continue on this a little bit more so because we still have we still have a couple of other important um, and critical areas to touch on but uh, Jethro reforming the adjudication is a very very important issue stay tuned if you will for the Ten Commandments the Ten Commandments is the next portion of this sabbatical reading and feeding that we will like to touch on and like to get into. So, brothers and sisters, stay tuned. Shalom.
Jah Rastafari. Jesus Christos, grace and peace be with you and be within you now and always. Amen.